please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Let us go before the Lord. Dear God, we thank you today for your loving kindness and for your tender mercy. We thank you for all that you are. Everything we need you to be, you are. Anything that we can imagine in our minds, you are. You're a healer, you're a deliverer, you're a friend, you're our savior, you're our redeemer, you're an intercessor. We thank you because you're sitting on the right hand of the Father. And you're praying for us when we don't know how to pray for ourselves. You are. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so, God, we pray that you would bless this moment right now. Anoint the word. Anoint my lips. Anoint our hearts that we might receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 And while you're standing, let's let's read these few verses in Scripture. Psalm, I'm sorry, Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 6. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. This is where we're going to kind of hang out today. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. So be concerned about your reputation. So I've been on, you know, for those of us that are on social media, you see people that are saying, I thought we left that in 2017. This notion of of not caring about what people think about you, we should have left that way back when, long before 2017. And in fact, people who say that I don't care what people think about me are probably the people who care the most. Then if we drop down, I just want to touch on a few, few things here in these, in these before I get to the six, six verses. A prudent man that says, smart people see trouble coming and avoid it. But the scripture says simple, the simple. Now y'all know where that word simpleton came from. Simpletons run right into it. Smart people see trouble coming and avoid it. It'll be just like saying, oh, I see that pothole, yet let me drive in it anyway. I see the cliff, let me fall over it anyway. Pastor tells us this all the time, to stay low. Talks about humility in verse 4. Focus on God. That's where you find the real treasures in life. Verse 5, traps are set for those who twist up the way and get off track. See, if you're on a straight path, you'll see the snares. It's when you walk off the path and you go into the thistle and you go into the brush. That's when you hit the trap that's been set for you. And then, like I said, we'll lodge here. Train up a child. But somebody has got to do the training. So repeat after me, school is in session.
Go to the next slide. Y'all need to go give me the clicker. So parents must train. I know this is Youth Sunday, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I want to set some groundwork. That involves instruction, encouragement, and discipline. And, and, and back in the day, there used to be this three-step plan. And, and if you look at it now, parents used to tell us what to do. And then we were verbally reminded or encouraged. And then there was discipline. So it kind of went like this. Clean your room. Instruction. Here was the encouragement. Did you hear what I said? And then the third time it was, I know you heard what I said. That's how it worked. Anybody remember that? Or was that just at my house? Amen, amen. I, I, I'm looking over at my uncle, Reggie, and I don't know if y'all got all three steps. It, it, it might have gone right from instruction to discipline. <laughs> my grandfather was tough. Um, we were physically reminded. And now in this day, you, you, you know, you probably, and we probably should have considered it back then that there were other ways of discipline more effective models, but, but, but weapons were their arsenal of choice. That was the arsenal of choice. But it worked. But, but the point is, is that somebody was training. So, somebody was doing something. It, it, I, I see too many times where kids look like they're running the parent. So parents, we must train. But what helps in the education process, people learn in different ways. Uh, it, sometimes they need object lessons. They need role models. They need life lessons. They need examples. Good parents model the behavior they want to see exhibited. Now, warning to the young folks, if they don't model it, it still don't mean you get to ignore the lesson. I mean, we've, I've, I've reviewed this over and over and over and over and over. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 just tells you to obey. It don't say if you like them. It don't say if you feel like they're fair. It just says obey. And verse 2 says it comes with a promise. The first commandment that came with a promise. So just do it. Amen? Now, there's certain things that, that, that we are responsible to teach. And, and, and I think sometimes we, we, we've relegated that to, to, to the schools and, and to TV and, and to other social ways. That, you know, we let them teach our kids about smoking and drinking and, and, and STDs and such because those topics are uncomfortable. And we certainly don't hear it talked about at the church because those topics are uncomfortable or maybe inappropriate. I, I don't know. Um, but, but, but when we leave those things to somebody else to provide the instruction, to provide a moral standard for our children, we fail. And even when we leave learning about God up to the church and there's no role for the parent, we fail. I've heard pastors say this before. The first Bible stories children out of here are not only come from the church. They ought to know something for to get here because something ought to be talked about at the house. That's the way they did it back in the Bible days. They sat around the table and they talked about the Bible with their children. And so if we're not going to talk about the morality, if we're not going to talk about the Bible or whatever, then how will they know? And so just like I don't want to assume that they got all the other lessons, I don't want to assume that these next things that we're going to talk about that they know. So we're going to have a fundamental Bible lesson today. Lesson number one. Young people, you are made in the image of God. 
We are not the byproduct of a chance combination of amino acids giving sufficient electrical charge to self-determine our advance from primordial seas to dry land and world domination. In other words, you're not the byproduct of the Big Bang. Your spirit, your spirit, not an alien, and an offspring of God. Genesis 1 and 26 said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. You are offspring of God. You're worth something. You're made in God's image. Lesson number one. Creation, you're not chance. You're not a mistake. I'm a... Even if you weren't intended, you're not a mistake. <laughs> did did, did y'all did y'all catch that? Even if you were not intended, you're not a mistake. You're not here by chance. And you have a purpose a divine purpose, a great purpose. You've got potential that's so unknown and the devil would love to tell you, you're just a mistake. And you're just here as a byproduct of happenstance. Lesson number two, the Bible is the word of God. It is. Did you hear that? You, 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 ever, you ever heard that, that, that question, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, does it make a sound? So if, if, if God speaks and nobody's listening, does that mean God is dead? Does that mean God is not talking if he speaks and we act like we don't hear him? And furthermore, God has not gone through the trouble to produce a book that is unimportant. He's got more stuff to do than to spend time and say, here's this thing, read it if you like. The Bible is a must read. I don't know what's on the New York bestseller list right now, but the Bible is a must read. The only way that the Bible will ever be of any value to anybody is if you read it. That's God's will. That's God's plan for us. If I die tomorrow and my kids never read my will, how will they know that I didn't leave them a thing? That was a joke. <clears throat> but ignorance is not bliss. If, if, my, if my son was walking through life thinking, man, daddy and him got something, and when he go, whew, I'm going to be set and I decide I don't want to leave you nothing, you be in a world of hurt. Ignorance is not bliss. You better make a plan. And don't wait until you have messed up to decide to figure out what you need to do. That, that, that's just like trying to assemble a thing, and then it looks all mangled, and you say, what's wrong with this? Because you failed to read the instructions. Christmas just passed. I know some of us tried to put together our kids' toys, and they probably did look that way. The Bible is full of commands, not suggestions. There's a billboard that was along the side of the word that was talking about that, that, a message that came from God, and it said, the Bible, God's word, I meant it. This is not a take it or leave it proposition. It's not I'll do it if I want to. He willed it for us to do, so we just ought to want to. Lesson number three. There is only one church. And I used to really only worry about this for college students because, you know, you go away to school and, and they expose your mind to things and, you know, all these other opportunities to see God and to experience God or whatever. Uh, but that's happening in more ways than we think. The truth is under attack in grade school. The, the alternative lifestyles are being pushed on our kids 
very early. So I worry about this church that the world says exists where you can do what you want to do, where you can live how you want to live, and you can blatantly ignore God's word, and it's all right. I worry about the fact that people say that church exists. But Christ died and paid a price for his church. And I've heard people say this after folks get saved. They'll say, now that you've gotten saved, you pick a church of your choice, select a a church of your choosing or something to that effect. It's not your choice. So you responded to Jesus and agreed to serve him. So you must serve him in his church. You you, you understand what I'm saying? You must serve Christ in his church, following his rules, his model. So we can't just live any kind of way. That'd be like a kid. That'd be like a household where there's multiple children and everybody interprets the rules differently. Got one set of parents. And when they say, we lock in the door at midnight, why do you think that means 1240? And why do you think that means 115? Midnight is midnight. And it would be a it, it would be a shameful thing for a parent to allow multiple rules to be followed. And Jesus don't allow multiple rules to be followed. There's only one way and there's only one church. So we must choose ye this day whom we will serve. Once we make a decision about who we're going to serve, the church has already been chosen for us. Lesson number four, there are wicked people in the world. And, and And as our pastor would say, I wish it wasn't so. I really do. There's an old saying that Will Rogers quote, I never met a man I didn't like. Unfortunately, there's probably nobody in this room who could repeat that. Because we probably all met some people that we don't like. Because unfortunately, there are wicked people in this world. And young people, it's disappointing when you learn that sometimes them wicked people are the folks that's closest to you. Sometimes claiming to be your closest friends. It's hard to accept that people who were once enjoyable and you could hang out with and kick back with that, that they're plotting to do evil against you. I know it hurts. I know it's painful. And, and, and uh, the, the Bible calls those individuals evil companions. And warns against them. In Proverbs 1, 10 through 19, it reads like this. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. How many shootings do we see? And we wonder, and we say that was senseless. There are wicked people in the world who just decide to prey on the innocent. Verse 15, he says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. The Bible warns us to stay away from evil folks. And the problem with hanging out with evil people as kids is that evil kids become evil adults. Uh 
and then they become evil parents. So avoid evil companions. But now, pastor told us about this a couple weeks ago, this next one, beware but be friendly. Now that doesn't mean that you're supposed to just run away from folks and that everybody is your mortal enemy. Because you'd walk through life very lonely if you said, I'm not going to take a chance on making a friend because they might be evil. But we know what evil looks like. We know what evil sounds like. And as my favorite TV judge would say, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. That's on the people's court. Lesson number five. God hates divorce. Now, I got to say something, because I see, I see them on social media. I see the young people on social media. And, and you know, and the, and, the, and the fellas be saying, you know, that's wifey. And I take offense to that, because I paid dues to call that woman wifey. <clears throat> and, and I... I've earned the right to give her that title of wifey. I done put in 23 good hard years of labor to earn the right to call her wifey. Young fella, you ain't earned it. You can't call her wifey and you can't expect wifey benefits. You ain't earned the right. And young lady, you haven't earned the title. So don't let him call you wifey. And don't let him ask you to give him wifey duties. All right, now that I got that off my chest, God hates divorce. And I know you say, well, why are you telling us about this? Because sometimes the, the evil companions that we, that we hook up with is that girl or that boy that we just so in love with. And we so determined to make it work and we so determined to stay with them and, and then, you, then you marry them. And you're stuck with them. Or maybe not, because in your mind you're thinking, well, if it don't work out, we'll just get a divorce. But God hates divorce. And there's all kind of collateral damage in a divorce. The children are negatively impacted. The parents, the spouses, whoever you remarry and you take all that baggage with you. Your friends. I mean, how do you decide who, who gets to keep the friends when you get a divorce? You invite me over for a party. I can't come because he going to be there. She going to be there. I ain't coming. It affects the church. You, 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 you divorce at a church. Do you stay at the church? I mean, do you, is, was divorce amicable? I mean, did y'all fight? Did y'all? The nation is under siege because the family has been under attack. So this mindset of if it don't work out, we'll just get it. We need to stop that. We need to make sure we pick in the right folks in the first place. And the Bible says that he who finds a wife, that's the other thing I was going to say. Young ladies, stop looking for him. Let him find you. Let him work. I worked. I called. I sent me. I was, and I, what, is my mother-in-law here? Where's my mother-in-law? Oh, man, I, listen, I dated my mother-in-law just as long as I dated my wife. I would call to talk to her, and then I, before I get to my wife, I'd be on the phone with my mother-in-law talking. And you know what? You know what, that has, you know what that has developed? That has developed a wonderful relationship. Because right now, today, I don't have the in-law problems that other people do. I hang out with my father-in-law, we go to the show, we have dinner, we have a good time. Because I did it right. I worked, but I worked. I worked for the right to call her wifey. 
So don't be in a rush to get all booed up. Lesson number six, baptism is important, but let's get it, let's get it, let's get this, the record set straight. As important as it is, baptism doesn't save. So I want you to understand that this, this whole <laughs> concept of making sure we understand what church we're in, baptism doesn't save you. You get baptized after you get saved. But here's the thing. Baptism implies there's some obligation. There's something that you have to do, uh, like live right, um, like, like walk right, um, like act right, because um, you're identifying with Christ when you go down. Otherwise, if, if, you, if, you, just, if you don't plan to change, you know, I said this before, you, you went down a, a dry center and came up a wet center. If you, don't, if you don't plan to change. So if, if you haven't changed in your heart already, don't waste time with baptism. Go home and take a bath. But, 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 but baptism implies that you're going to do something. R Romans 6, 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? Certainly not. So once we, once we say we on the lower side, we got to change. We, we, we can't continue to be who we were. So um, we talked about this in church school this morning. I know God knows your heart, knows all of our hearts, and he knows when they're raggedy. And he knows when you have no intention to be different. He knows when you're just making an excuse for your behavior, when you just say, oh, my bad. No, you, you knew. You planned those words. But we got to be willing, we got to be willing to take a stand for what the, the thing is that we signed up for. We, when we go down in baptism, when we come up, we say we die with Christ and we rose with him so we can walk together. I was at my wife's, one of my wife's friends' uh, 50th birthday, and there was an altercation that happened over some, some sorority stuff. One, one, one friend wanted to touch something that was, and the other friend said, well, you're not in the sorority, and they almost came to blows about a fraternity, about a sorority, but somebody who died for us. We wear it so loosely. We just saying you are but we don't take it seriously enough. Baptism implies some obligation. And then the final lesson, and I, this, this is something that, that the uh, old folks used to say to us. Sin is dark, hell is hot, and eternity is forever. And that's just the real deal. That is just the real, sin is, sin is ugly, and sin stains you. Even though we're forgiven for sin, there's people who can't forgive themselves. There's other people who can't forgive you. There's other people that are going to remember the thing that you did or the thing that you said forever. Sin has consequences. And unrepentant sin has the ultimate consequence, and that's that hot hell. Hell is not a joke. Hell is a real place. Hell is not a fairy tale. Mark 9, 44 through 48 tells us and describes what hell is. Place where worms, their worm don't die and the fire is not quenched. And says this about sin. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it's better for you to enter the light, this life lame rather than having two feet in the end up in hell. So the thing that, you, it's better that you cut the sin off than to walk around with it and end up in hell. It's rather, the, the next verse says, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. The Lord is saying he'd rather you walk around limping with a patch on your eye. But you've gotten rid of the sin, that thing that will cause you to go to hell. 
than to walk around totally with all your limbs and extremities. Lesson summary. He's just like school. You are made in the image of God. The Bible is the word of God. There's only one church. There are wicked people in this world. God hates divorce. Baptism is important. Sin is dark. Hell is hot. And eternity is forever. Now, we said a lot today, and I moved through most of it quickly, but, but if I can leave this with you. Wherever you might have failed or fallen or slipped, you don't have to stay there. Because all you have to do is remember this. Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And so I, I want to offer today, if there's anyone in the building that has fallen short, and the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and maybe you didn't sin this week, but you have. But if you find yourself in, in the way of a sinner right now and you would like to get that straight, we're going to ask that you would come and receive Jesus. Is there one? Thank you for joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter.